Okay, I don't see our number ticking up much more quickly. So hello everyone, my name is Rebecca Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the DC Preservation League. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are Washington DC citywide nonprofit advocate founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting and enhancing the historic and built environment of our nation's capital. I have a few things to go over before we get started. First, I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programming like this one today. They are the DC Commission on Arts and Humanities, QTAC Rock, Douglas Development Corporation, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Robert Benson Photography, Bayer Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, EHT Traceries, KCE Structural Engineers, and Quinn, Quinn Evans Architects. Thank you for all of your dedication to historic preservation in DC. If you're interested in more information on sponsorship, please feel free to reach out to me or to Kelly uh, Knox. Uh, moving on, we have a few notes on how today's webinar will be run. Um, if you have a question, please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions, and we will go through them towards the end of the program. The chat will not be available during the presentations, but will be open for the discussion period. For those joining us on Facebook, Zach will be monitoring any questions you might have and sending them over our way um, uh, here on Zoom. And now that we've covered that, I'm so pleased to introduce to you all to today's speakers who will be talking about um, Automobile Row over on 14th Street. Kim Williams is an architectural historian for the Historic Preservation Office, specializing in the evaluation of historic resources for the designation, for, for designation eligibility. Her work includes conducting historic context and resource studies, preparing national register nominations, both new nominations and amendments to existing ones, and writing and editing print and web-based publications on the city's historic resources and neighborhood historic districts. Kim has over 15 years of experience in historic preservation in Washington, actually more like 35. Yeah, try 30. <laughs> I was like, that's a typo. So um, I'm like, I've been here 20 and you've been here much longer than me. So um, she has a master's in architectural history from the University of Virginia with a certificate in historic preservation. And Steve Calcutt is joining us. He's the deputy historic preservation officer for the State Historic Preservation Office, also the historic preservation office here in DC uh, for the District of Columbia. Uh, with more than 30 years of project review experience, he oversees the daily operations of the Historic Preservation Project Review staff at HPO and develops design guidelines and preservation design review policies and serves as the primary staff liaison to the Historic Preservation Review Board. Uh, Steve is responsible for the review of many of the larger rehabilitation and new construction projects in the downtown and mid-city neighborhoods. And prior to joining HPO in 1992, he served for four years as the Associate Director of none other than the DC Preservation League. Builds a BA in architectural history from the University of North Carolina and a master's in historic preservation from Cornell University. So with that, I will turn it over to Steve and Kim to talk about automobile role. Thanks so much. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm Kim, everybody, hello. I thought I would start our presentation today just by giving a little bit of a background on 14th Street and its rise as automobile row in the 1920s. Uh, next slide, Steve. Thanks. Um, so the first slide is a detail of an 1857 map by cartographer Albert Boschke, and it shows 14th Street running north-south through Thomas Circle at the center of the slide. As you can tell from this map, the area above Thomas Circle around 14th Street was largely undeveloped with a scattering of buildings, small farms, which you can see above Rhode Island Avenue there, you can see the sort of vegetation indicated in the map. That shows uh, farms and then there were nurseries there. Many of those nurseries provided uh, the, the trees that were used for lining the streets of the new city. Um, in fact, before the Civil War, Massachusetts Avenue was considered the unofficial boundary between the city and rural Washington. There was an early 19th century law which named Massachusetts Avenue as the boundary above which swine were allowed to roam free. And in 1862, upon visiting DC, English novelist Anthony Trollope wrote, Massachusetts Avenue runs the whole length of the city and is inserted on the maps as a full grown street about four miles in length. Go there and you will find yourself not only out of town, 
away among the fields, but you will find yourself beyond the fields in an uncultivated, undrained wilderness. Tucking your trousers up to your knees, you will wade through the bogs. You will lose yourself among the rude hillocks. You will be out of reach of humanity. So <laughs> that, that uh, somewhat probably exaggerated uh, description of the area north of Massachusetts Avenue does describe the undeveloped character of 14th Street above Thomas Circle. This uh, character would begin to change with the Civil War. And the war necessitated the development of the city's first streetcar lines to help move troops and refugees into and out of the city. These lines, including one laid along 14th Street from New York Avenue to Boundary Street, provided access to the Civil War forts, the camps, the refugee settlements, asylums, and hospitals that were built on the outskirts of the city. These streetcar lines were not limited to this wartime use, however, but they generally served the growing population and they opened up undeveloped areas uh, for residential growth. Um, next slide, please. Following the Civil War, the population more than doubled in the city and the city began to develop rapidly. 14th Street with its streetcar line and improved city services was equipped to receive this influx of residents. This is a historic image of 14th Street from just below Thomas Circle. And you can see Luther Place Memorial Church right at the top of the head of Thomas Circle uh, between Vermont Avenue and 14th Street. Luther Place uh, Memorial Church was actually built shortly after the Civil War as a memorial of Thanksgiving for the end of the war. And it really served as kind of a gateway between old downtown and the Victorian city that would emerge just beyond it. So I love this image because it really shows how that church, one of the first major structures beyond Thomas Circle really served as the gateway to the Victorian city, which today we consider the old city, whereas the old city was below Thomas uh, Circle before that. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So uh, after the Civil War in the 1870s with improvements in um, infrastructure, gas lines, water mains being laid, uh, residential construction really took off around for either side of 14th Street. There were long rows of speculative dwellings that were built along the side streets and along the avenues. And uh, there were commercial, mostly commercial buildings that lined uh, 14th Street, which was of course, the major transportation corridor with the streetcar line and streetcars running up and down. At that point, after the war, the streetcar line had been extended beyond Boundary Street even. Um, these are just a couple of examples of the oldest commercial buildings um, on the street. The, for, you know, throughout the 1870s and 1880s, there were just a plethora of new commercial buildings. The number and variety of stores multiplied. They were grocers and dealers of dry goods, fancy goods, shoe repairs, tinsmiths, and more. Um, these two of the oldest ones are um, the Hebner Bakery and Kolb's Confectionery at 1508 14th Street, which you see on the left. This building was built in 1864, completed by 1869, as really a small commercial structure that may have just been one story tall, but by 1874, this German baker, Martin Hebner, moved in. He operated his bakery out of the, the first floor and he added the two floors above where he lived. And then in 1904, John Kolb, a confectioner, uh, moved in and you can see he built the pediment with his name in the center of that pediment, which you can see still exists today. And then the Samuel Lewis Pharmacy. This is a building at the corner of 14th and P Streets. It's a great Second Empire style building with a pharmacy was in the corner uh, ground floor level. And um, the uh, pharmacist lived in the upper two floors uh, with his family. Uh, next slide, please. But after the invention of the automobile, there was of course a need to store, display and repair these new machines. Uh, they were often referred to as machines in uh, period uh, uh, press of the time. And according to period trade journals, the sites for automobile showrooms were chosen with great care. Primary consideration was given to streets with heavy pleasure traffic, but that were far enough from downtowns to avoid excessive costs in land. So 14th Street as an important transportation route leading into and out of the city, it's heavy streetcar and pedestrian traffic, 
and its location just beyond downtown proved an ideal site for the rise of automobile related buildings. To begin with, and before the development of the automobile showroom as a building type, dealers altered existing buildings to accommodate this new use. And this is an example of um, one of these alterations of a historic building. This was built, this building was actually three attached Queen Anne uh, commercial buildings built in 1888. They all had projecting bays as would be typical of a Victorian Queen Anne building. Um, but they were remodeled by uh, the Luttrell Company, who is the distributor of the Pontiac and Oakland cars. And according to the building permits for this alteration, the remodeling called for cutting off the bay windows and applying stucco over the brick. And um, it also involved uh, adding the large show windows on the first floor um, and introducing the pilaster separating the large show windows um, from the first floor up to the second floor. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the very first purpose-built automobile showroom was constructed in 1904 on a still vacant lot. There were not that many vacant lots left on 14th Street by then, but there was at least one. Um, and this, the construction of this building, it was built for the National Automobile Company, uh, is shown on the left in its original uh, uh, physical appearance anyway. And it attracted significant attention in the local press for being designed as, as an automobile building, specifically for the sale of automobiles. And articles on the building's construction touted its interior features that included men's and women's reception rooms, chauffeur rooms, lockers, and offices, and a storeroom. It also had a storage capacity for 100 to 150 cars on the second floor. And it had a repair garage at the rear of the building uh, at the alley, on the alley, that would be approached from the alley. Um, the image on the right, you can see, is taken after some alterations were made to the building in 1924 to 1927. Um, the building, which had exposed brick, was altered and stuccoed with a sort of scored stucco, and uh, new windows were put in the ground floor from the smaller arched openings to larger, wider, rectangular openings. Uh, next slide, please. By the, early, uh, by the late 19-teens and early 1920s, there was a profusion of new automobile showrooms that began to replace the smaller and older Victorian buildings along 14th Street. Car dealers commissioned architects to design new and elegant buildings according to advice provided by the manufacturers. The manufacturers recommended that dealers hire architects largely because well-designed showrooms would increase sales and bring a financial return and investment to both the dealer and the manufacturer. Manufacturers also recommended corner sites which would provide full principal street frontage for the ready display of new cars for sale, but also more discreet access to rear uh, repair shops and garages located uh, at the rear of the buildings. And here in the slide, um, you can see on the right, which is T Street, on the right side of the slide, um, you can see the service access. It's a sort of a small door with a little mm -hmm. marquees there. That would have been the pedestrian entrance to the service uh, part of the building at the rear of the building. But of course, corner sites along 14th Street were limited, and so it prevented the dual role of showroom and repair facilities in a single building. So instead, repair facilities and garages were um, constructed nearby along the corridor's minor streets like Church Street. Less attention was given to the design appearance of the service buildings, giving these streets their semi-industrial character uh, today. Next slide, please. Manufacturers also emphasize that architectural design should not be limited to the exterior of buildings. The interiors needed to be elegant spaces. The goal for dealers, according to the manufacturers, was to convey an image of luxury that the buyers of automobiles were already accustomed to. This is the interior of the True Motor Company building. And uh, next slide, Steve. Thanks. And this is an exterior of uh, the True Motor Car Company. Um, showrooms often reflected exotic building styles like the theaters of the day. 
they were that were lavishly ornamented. One of the most exotic examples, which I don't have shown here, but I think Steve has an image of in his presentation, is uh, the Egyptian revival style show, showroom, which is now the Mitchell Gold um, building. And it was built for the Wardman Motor Company. And that's, that was designed in you know, very exotic Egyptian revival style on both the interior and the exterior. But the true motor company, true motor car company was the largest of the street showrooms. And it was one of the largest, um, not only of, of the street, but of the city too. It was a distributor of the Peerless and the REO Speedwagon. When the True Motor Company then built another building to abut this one just, for, just uh, north on 14th Street, this building actually became home to the Peerless Motor Company while the building just north of it housed the REO Speedwagon exclusively. Um, the three-story building housed the showroom on the first floor a storage room for new cars and a sales room for used cars on the second story and a service department on the third story. And now the studio theater, this building was one of the first major rehabs of automobile showrooms on 14th Street. And I will turn it over to Steve to talk about some of these rehab projects. And that is a great segue. It's almost like we coordinated these talks. Because <laughs> uh, uh, the first project I'm going to talk about is the studio theater. But before I, I'm going to talk about six projects overall, most of which were uh, went, went through the historic preservation and construction process uh, back between about uh, 2000 uh, to about 2014. Uh, and interestingly, you know, most of these showroom buildings have uh, have have been uh, renovated now for for well over a decade. So, um, uh, but before I talk about the specific projects, I wanted to just provide a little bit of historical context about uh, uh, the redevelopment process and two factors in particular that I think were quite influential in shaping all of these projects. Uh, the first one was the establishment of the Uptown Arts Overlay District, a zoning district uh, that was established in 1989 uh, by the Zoning Commission. It was an overlay zone to the existing underlying commercial zones for 14th Street, uh, which was brought forth by the community, uh, Logan Scroll Community Association, the ANCs at the time, uh, to promote uh, arts uses uh, and provide uh, some uh, additional density uh, and uh, and flexibility to the zoning for arts related uses uh, to encourage uh, uh, active ground level uses. Uh, you have to remember at the time back in the 1980s, um, a lot of these storefronts were boarded up uh, or bricked up. Uh, and so there was a lot of interest in getting street life uh, activated again. Uh, and so this uh, zoning overlay uh, had requirements uh, for doing that. It also provided slight density increases for the creation of residential uses. Again, at the time, there was no residential uh, along 14th Street. Uh, it, was, it was solely a commercial corridor. And I think wisely, the community realized that to get the sort of activated uh, uh, liveliness to it, uh, it needed not only additional commercial and arts uses, but also needed residents. Um, the second uh, uh, sort of land use change uh, that went into effect uh, was the creation of the 14th Street Historic District. Uh, the Logan Circle Community Association worked for several years in the early 1990s to do a survey uh, of the, the neighborhood, of the broader neighborhood, not just along 14th Street, but of course the residential blocks uh, on either side of it and petitioned the city to create an historic district, which would establish regulatory protections uh, for preventing demolition and encouraging uh, adaptation and sensitive uh, alterations to the buildings. Uh, that historic district went into effect in 1994. Uh, uh, it stopped at S Street uh, because that was a ward boundary. It was also kind of the boundary of both the ANC and the uh, Logan Circle Community Association. Um, uh, and then the U Street neighborhood uh, to the north of that, north of S Street, was designated in 1998. So the protections went into effect there. So we really got the entire corridor uh, established as an historic district uh, by 1998. Uh, these were very timely uh, because this was really before there was extensive redevelopment pressures uh, on 14th Street. Um, uh, again, if you sort of uh, remember back or if you read back, if you weren't there around, uh, uh, the city really started uh, rebounding uh, economically uh, around 
around 2000, uh, uh, 14th Street followed suit. Uh, it was pretty, pretty quiet and pretty moribund at the time, uh, but uh, these protections were in place at just the right time before there was substantial speculative uh, real estate development pressures so that when uh, developers started com coming in and looking at properties on 14th Street, the fact that these protections, uh, the zoning protections and the historic district protections were already in place, they they knew that they were going to be uh, held to those standards, uh, and uh, and it, it 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 actually eased a lot of the pressure uh, because the expectations were already established prior to them becoming property owners uh, uh, and starting their redevelopment projects. So Kim already touched a little bit on the studio theater. I think of this as really sort of the first uh, auto showroom building reinvention. Um, uh, Studio Theater located in this building before the historic district uh, uh, and before that zoning change in 1988. Uh, Joy Zinneman was the uh, sort of pioneer uh, arts uh, uh, um, uh, uh, establishment person uh, on 14th Street. She was uh, very much behind the charge to establish that Uptown Arts Overlay District. Um, but by about 2000, and, and they, they established this in, in 88, uh, operated uh, for a little bit more than a decade uh, in this building, uh, there were some pretty extensive changes to be able to insert a, a theater uh, in the space. Um, uh, but by about 2002, they were interested in expanding. Uh, and they looked at the two buildings that Kim uh, referenced, which were also built by the True Motor Company. Uh, this one, a very simple garage building uh, in, uh, in uh, I think in 1920. Uh, and then the more imposing uh, building, the four-story building, I think the only four-story uh, uh, um, showroom building that we have on 14th Street um, uh, which was built in 1922, so just a few years later. Um, and as you can see, sort of uh, a little bit more in character with the 1920s uh, expression of, of stripped classical limestone, industrial windows, uh, very nice uh, uh, embedded um, uh, metal panels here. Um, and so Studio was looking to, uh, to expand into these. Uh, they hired Bill Bonstra uh, as their architect. Uh, they were not only looking for additional studio space, but they were looking to really um, uh, establish more uh, meeting spaces, more informal uh, lobby spaces where patrons could, uh, could meet at intermission and have coffee and that sort of thing. And so they hit on this idea of doing a very bold, uh, glassy addition on top of the two-story uh, 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 center building here. Um, they also wanted to do really bold graphics. They wanted it to be a really outward expression uh, of, of the use. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, sort of both of those you'd think, you know, might run into sort of historic preservation concerns. There was some negotiation uh, uh, about, about, about this, but ultimately the review board although they had typically had and, and still do have a policy that discourages visible roof additions on historic buildings. In this instance, they thought that the very simple nature of this building, uh, of the center building, uh, and, uh, and the, as well as the sort of light glassy nature of the addition, uh, they thought that this was, uh, was, was acceptable uh, as, a, as a preservation solution. Um, it ultimately got uh, um, uh, simplified slightly. That angle was a little bit too expensive to build uh, and drain. Um, uh, and uh, this ultimately, and some of the graphics were toned down as well. Um, but uh, this sort of uh, set the stage for, as one of the first projects that went through the historic preservation review process for um, maybe considering these auto showroom, showroom buildings a little bit differently. Maybe they don't, uh, you know, don't apply ex all the same rules uh, to them. And, and by that, I mean, uh, perhaps some of them as, as sort of big, strong industrial buildings can support uh, visible roof additions if they're designed in this sort of light, glassy vocabulary. Um, and that also finding that balance between uh, preservation and the community's desire for an arts district and, and having something on this building that clearly expressed uh, its, its arts uses, uh, was open, again, remembering that 
uh, so many of the storefronts had been boarded up, doing a very glassy open edition where people could look up and see people circulating and, and, and going to the theater uh, was, uh, was, was valuable in terms of providing activation. Uh, this is how the project, of course, turned out. Uh, I don't have slides. Uh, it's, it's recently gone through a, another remodel, uh, and the canopy and some of the struts have been uh, have been modified slightly, and it's got uh, a big bold studio sign on top of this building now. Um, uh, the interior space on the right is the is the glassy atrium on top of the two story building and one of the three theaters. Uh, none of the interiors uh, that Kim showed in the slide a couple slides ago uh, remain, uh, nor did they remain at the time that this project was, was going through the review process. Uh, the next project just, just to the north um, uh, was uh, the first uh, proposed, uh, one of the first, no, sorry, not the first, one of the first uh, proposed uh, residential projects. Um, this, sorry, this is such a grainy photograph. It's obviously really old. Uh, um, and what we're looking at is the three-story building on the right, which was built in 1928 uh, as a Hudson auto dealership. Robert Schultz was the uh, DC architect. Robert Schultz was the uh, architect. Um, the permit identifies it as a store, uh, but it was clearly a store for selling automobiles. It was a purpose-built automobile showroom. Um, in 2003, um, we received a really unusual proposal for a project uh, to uh, by developer Giorgio Furioso uh, with architect Suman Sorg to do an addition uh, both on top of the building, uh, like the one at Studio Theater, as well as on the vacant land uh, to the north of the building. Uh, as you can see, this was a very sort of dynamic kind of cubist, Frank Gehry inspired uh, 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 design. This went through the review process probably about four or five times. Uh, uh, ultimately, uh, it was determined uh, too expensive to build, uh, but there was a lot, you can see the effort to try and relate to, uh, you know, the, the use of limestone, the use of, uh, you know, uh, use of copper to relate to the copper panels uh, on the building, um, but obviously in a very fractured uh, sort of vocabulary. Ultimately, as I say, this, this is one of those paper projects that was never built. Um, and then in uh, 2010, Giorgio turned to our architect Eric Colbert uh, to design this as an office building. And just for a little bit of context, if you remember 2010 was just a year or so after the, the, the housing crisis, uh, getting uh, loans for residential buildings were very challenging. Um, and so this was built as an office building for the Whitman Walker Clinic, which was looking to expand. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, the, uh, it, it, it abandons the, the cubist vocabulary uh, for a little bit more ordered uh, 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 composition of, of parts uh, in which uh, there's, uh, you know, the uh, sort of a, a play on the auto showroom building um, vocabulary of large windows with masonry for the uh, with very vertical proportions uh, on the left hand side, uh, and then a little bit more of a backdrop component uh, with the metal and glass higher proportion of glass uh, for the other for the other pieces of it. Um, the uh, auto showroom building itself was repurposed as a restaurant uh, uh, now. Uh, uh, Sotheby's uh, realty office um, and uh, art galleries above. Uh, and, uh, and then the office building is really an independent building kind of around and on top of the historic building. Uh, and then some sexy photographs that I got from Eric Colbert's website. So thank you for that, Eric, better than my photographs, uh, uh, in which you see it in the context of the street. Um, across the street on the other side uh, of 14th Street, you see uh, a series of four auto showroom buildings. Um, 1510 and 1520 are on the south side of Church Street, two matching buildings designed by local architect George Ray in 1928. And then on the north side of Church Street uh, is 1522 and 1526 14th Street. Um, the first one, uh, 1522, uh, was designed by A.O. Hebulus, who, I don't know who that is, Kim, do you know who that is? 
Um, I don't know much about him, but he was an Austrian architect, and I don't yeah. know how. Yeah, I don't really know how. He wasn't a prolific DC architect. Right, right. Um, and that was designed for the Hurley Motor Company. Uh, and then the uh, Egyptian Revival Building that uh, Kim was referring to uh, is the next one, designed in 1925 by B. Stanley Simmons, who you've seen his name uh, for several of the other buildings, clearly had a little bit of a lock on, uh, on the auto showroom uh, 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 industry. Um, these buildings were uh, uh, owned by the Unification Church, uh, uh, dating back from the 1970s and even a little bit earlier. Uh, developer Scott Panic uh, uh, struck a deal uh, to buy all of these buildings, um, uh, did very high quality rehabilitations uh, of their exterior elevations. Um, uh, relatively modest uh, one story addition on the buildings to the north. Uh, this is a, a, a sort of a cutaway water view, watercolor um, that you, obviously is, is sort of artistic uh, and shows all the, the way down Church Street. Um, and what's sort of interesting about this is that it began to establish how Church Street was redeveloped through the preservation review process, which was to break um, new construction down into sort of smaller component parts so as to not overwhelm the few remaining historic buildings there and establish a little bit more of an organic feel uh, to that street with varieties of heights and setbacks uh, and architectural expressions. Uh, and then uh, a very neutral uh, uh, expression for the rooftop addition pulled very, very far back so that it wouldn't be visible at all from 14th Street. Uh, this is the addition as seen uh, on Church Street. Uh, this is the south side of the street, the two buildings designed by George Ray at the front. Um, you can kind of see in this picture that the, uh, it, it, as you see, it turns to a, a, a brown brick, uh, one bay in. Um, the reviewer did approve adding one floor. You can see the break in the, in the brickwork, uh, approving one floor of additional brickwork on top of that, uh, that rear piece and then really expressing itself as a, uh, a new building, a different building going a full six stories up uh, beyond that. And then there's another component that you see further back that drops down to five stories. Uh, and again, kind of uh, various component parts to break down the scale as it marches down, uh, down the street. Uh, a primary component of this project uh, was uh, recreating the really high quality uh, storefront designs. The one on the right, the Mitchell Gold building, um, uh, still has its original uh, fascia or the, the, the crown mold uh, with the urns uh, of the original storefront. The, uh, the, the glazing and the glazing uh, uh, framing members are new steel uh, storefront systems. Um, the storefront on the left is a complete recreation of what was long missing uh, but based on historic photographs and drawings, uh, and you see the really decorated sort of acroteria uh, at the top of that, uh, which uh, to my knowledge is, is sort of the, probably the most decorated storefront uh, of any of these showroom buildings uh, along 14th Street. Um, what I don't have, unfortunately, is a photograph of the interior of the Mitchell Gold Building, which is one of the very few buildings which does still have its interior um, and if you haven't been, you should go by and take a look at it. Uh, it's uh, very nicely intact. And that's that building. Um, going back across the street, uh, the last project in the 1500 block of 14th Street, uh, uh, another building uh, designed in 1928 by George Ray. Um, this project includes uh, the, the vacant lot to the, to, the, to the right or to the south uh, of the showroom building, which is kind of hidden behind the tree, as well as the vacant site to the north or to the left of the, uh, of the showroom building. As you can see the showroom building, you can sort of see the showroom building's uh, windows were still intact, but they were about halfway bricked up. Um, uh, this project was also done by Eric Colbert uh, uh, for a residential conversion with ground level retail. Um, this is the first instance of a project in which the new construction was influenced pretty directly by the character of 
uh, the auto showroom buildings. As you can see, again, they, they sort of broke the project down into three pieces. The showroom building is in the center, uh, sort of a kind of a maybe a uh, sort of a Edwardian era uh, kind of styled building on the right, the five story piece. Uh, and then the six story piece on the left, uh, which uh, I think in its vocabulary and detailing, you can understand that it's contemporary new construction, but clearly influenced by the proportions, the monumental uh, piers, uh, the attic story, the, the sort of stepped parapet uh, of, the, of the streets auto showroom buildings. Uh, and in, in greater or lesser degrees, this was a trend that uh, other new construction, some other new construction projects followed. Um, as you see here, this also had uh, a, a roof addition, fortunately set back uh, to where it's not uh, prominently visible in perspective views because of the flanking the taller new construction. Um, and this is just viewing it in context uh, with a uh, very nice cleanup of the original windows uh, and, and metal panel system and uh, a recreation of the original storefronts. Uh, the original storefronts were not really salvageable, uh, but a, a nice, uh, nice attention to detail on those as well. Uh, and other direction. Um, Moving up to the 1600 block uh, of uh, 14th Street, uh, the uh, possibly, I actually said before, uh, the other one was the only four story. This, this is obviously four stories as well. Um, uh, 1631 14th Street, the Central Union Mission uh, was built in 1922 as a Studebaker showroom uh, by Frederick Pyle uh, with the Wardman Construction Company. The site also included uh, th what had originally been three Victorian sort of Queen Anne row houses to the right. You see two of them here. The one on the on the very end with the red tile roof uh, was a Victorian uh, one of the one of the three in this row, but all of which also had projecting bays originally. Um, but it was completely refaced uh, in 1911 with a facade by Appleton P. Clark in uh, what you can see is kind of a mission arts and crafts uh, style, um, uh, specifically for uh, the sales of auto parts. Uh, the other Victorian townhouses um, had largely been gutted uh, in the 19 teens or 20s with um, concrete frame construction being put in because those were converted to uh, for use as an automobile garage. Uh, and then of course the, the corner building uh, was an auto showroom uh, and served as in a variety for a variety of different uh, showrooms uh, over the years. Um, in 2012, uh, this uh, site was all assembled uh, and a project uh, developed for conversion to residential and retail use. Um, uh, with uh, restoration of the, uh, uh, the Victorian buildings back to at least on the upper two floors, but with new storefronts on the first floor, um, uh, uh, recreation of the original storefronts on the corner mission building itself, the Studebaker Show House. Uh, they kept the come unto me uh, uh, sign from the mission because they thought it was just a cool part of its history. Um, and then on the Appleton Clark building, uh, they located the original storefront plans for that. Uh, and it included this really unusual detail in the transom design in which it's, as you see, it's an abstracted tire. Uh, um, so this was selling tires and on auto showroom uh, or auto parts. Um, and this was sort of a mimetic uh, expression uh, of, the, uh, of the use within. And so that was, uh, that was very satisfying to get that recreated. And then the last project, which uh, Kim already showed you this photo, uh, the Taylor Motor Company uh, built originally also by B. Stanley Simmons in 1919. The four-story addition on the left uh, was uh, built in, uh, in 1922, just a few years later. Um, this was uh, used for after Taylor, it was used as a Ford dealership, an Oldsmobile dealership. Um, and then for many years in the mid 20th century, uh, up until the 1990s, was used as a church, an evangelical church, Church of the Rapture, um, 
which um, uh, ended up selling uh, this. Uh, initially, uh, there was a proposal for residential development uh, for adding three floors uh, on the back of it. Uh, that ultimately did not uh, go, th did, not, um, did not pan out economically. Again, it sort of failed as part of the, um, the downturn in 2008. Uh, and then in 2009 was bought by uh, Room and Board for their flagship store. Um, uh, and again, you see uh, the same idea as Studio Theater set forth uh, uh, a decade earlier, uh, the notion of uh, gaining a little bit of additional space by doing a glassy uh, addition on top. Uh, this went through the review board process with a lot of modeling to understand uh, how this was going to look. Uh, um, it's set back to the first structural bay uh, on both the uh, T Street and the 14th Street side, so no need for sort of internal additional internal structure. Um, uh, and then also a lot of attention to uh, to uh, not exactly recreating the storefronts, as you can see from the original design. Uh, the the door was in a slightly different place, but you can see that it's clearly inspired uh, by the original storefront, and that was that was quite intentional. So, um, so those are the projects. Uh, and uh, I, if I had had you know maybe one more day, I could have come up with some great conclusion to like wrap all of this together. Uh, but um, uh, again, I think you see some of the themes uh, that emerged through the historic preservation process, uh, as well as the as well as the results, which um, I think you know, 14th Street is one of the greatest streets in DC in terms of its liveliness, in terms of its architecture, uh, and in terms of its reinvention of these historic buildings. Uh, so, um, but I'll be fascinated to hear what other people have to say, uh, and uh, so fire away with questions if you have any. Thank you, Kim and Steve, appreciate it. Um, one question that I have before we get started, um, is there any way to determine the economic impact that this has had on this neighborhood? Or has there been any studies done on that? Uh, I'm, to the first question, I'm sure there are uh, ways to do economic impact studies. Um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, I mean, you know, there, there's sort of anecdotal ways of looking at it. You can clearly look at, you know, you know, rising property values. Uh, you can look at, you know, uh, number of visitors uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, 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 but to my knowledge, there has not been a specific economic or, or other type of study that is, has evaluated that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll make a side note just to when somebody is, I was asked previously about historic preservation, they're like, well, what, is, what exactly do you do? And I just asked them, I said, well, where'd you go to dinner last night? They said, oh, well, 14th Street. And I'm like, why'd you go there and not K Street? They're like, why would I go to K Street? I'm like, <laughs> exactly what we do. Placemaking right there. Because why would you go to K Street? For dinner? Exactly. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. One being, um, are automobile dealerships especially good for adaptive reuse? And if so, how would you summarize what makes it so good, particularly like its features? Um, I would say yes. I mean, I, interestingly, there was there were very few sort of preservation. There were design review uh, um, challenges with these, like how you know what should the setback of the of the addition be? Should it even have a, a rooftop addition? Uh, but in terms of the preservation challenges, nobody came to us saying you know oh these buildings are dilapidated and they have to be torn down. Uh, these are solid, solid buildings. They were built to, you know, store uh, and house automobiles. So, you know, heavily constructed. Um, uh, and uh, fortunately, none of them had had, uh, you know, sort of failures in their roof that could have like seeped down and gotten into the rebar and, and rusted out the, the concrete and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, so they're, they're very solidly built. Uh, um, even to the extent to which, as I said, you know, a, an additional floor or two could often be added to the existing structure without any need for additional structure being put in. Very different than frame buildings. You know, you think about a row house. Uh, uh, you can maybe add, you know, a partial third or fourth floor to a row house. Beyond that, you don't have the structural capacity, and you need to, either need to demolish the build and demolish the underlying structure or really heavy up the structure. So. Um, so in that respect, uh, uh, very easy. Um, you know, the, the preservation challenges with these projects uh, were often, you know, 
for that we got really good quality industrial windows, which are, you know, more expensive than, you know, cheap aluminum windows. But within the context of these projects, which were all pretty sizable redevelopments, um, that was um, not an expense that that any of the developers balked at. And, and I think everybody knows and, and appreciates that these buildings are just sort of cool. Uh, people like them. Uh, and want everybody wanted to invest in them properly and make sure that they uh, they were um, you know presented well. I think the uh, what was unfortunate was that there were so few interiors of these. Uh, you know, I think all of these or most of them had uh, some of which we have images of and some we don't um, had really wonderful first floor interiors, lobby spaces, and that sort of thing. And um, again, with the exception of the Mission, with the, with the, the Shinola store now, and the Mitchell Gold store, I'm not really aware of any substantive remaining features on the interiors of these. Yeah, they're interesting. And I think a lot of people don't even realize on 14th Street that it was automobile roll, because uh, when we've mentioned it in the past, people are really surprised by it, especially given where it is in the city because mm -hmm. you expect automobile places to be more kind of outskirts, even though this was basically an outskirt of the city as Kim described. Um, so were there other major automobile related buildings that did not survive? And with that, where else are there auto rows in DC? That was H Street, landmark dealership on H Street Northeast? Um, yeah, so there were other automobile showrooms for sure. 14th Street had the greatest density of automobile showrooms, and it was actually dubbed on a automobile row in the 1920s and 30s. So, um, so it, it did have, you know, the greatest number and collection of automobile showrooms, but there were some on H Street Northeast, all of the transportation corridors had them. Um, Connecticut Avenue had quite a few. Um, that, that still stands. So the Sims Automobile Company had its showroom at the Circle at Connecticut Avenue, where the PNC Bank is today. That was an auto automobile showroom. Where La Tomate Restaurant is, that was an automobile showroom. Um, a little further north on the east side of the street, and a little further up Connecticut Avenue, both the east and west sides are a couple of different automobile showrooms. So Connecticut Avenue was also, you know, a pretty important corridor for, for showrooms. Um, but you're right, basically what happened was as um, suburban, you know, people moved out to the suburbs, automobile showrooms really moved out to the suburbs with them. And it also was, you know, land was expensive in the district and it was preferably automobile showrooms were one story buildings. And so they occupied great footprints. Um, and getting that kind of land in city in the cities was was challenging. And that's why they did two and three and four story buildings. But they would preferably do one story. So, as the suburbs offered that opportunity to do larger footprint single story buildings, uh, the showrooms moved out to the suburbs really um, mid century. So, but yeah, Fourteenth Street has had not only historically the greatest density. It was dubbed Automobile Row during uh, its history, and it has the greatest number of surviving automobile showrooms. And speaking of it being multi multiple floors, there's a question as to how did the vehicles get to the upper floors? Yeah, so there were hydraulic elevators that carried the cars up. So um, oftentimes you will see the, the elevator shaft rising above the roof line of these buildings, and they just had big elevator spaces and the car would go in it and they would uh, hoist it up to the second, third and, and sometimes fourth floors. So these were, yeah, structurally very substantial buildings that could carry a lot of weight. Great. And um, so were there rules and practices uh, with regard to signage, especially lighted signage historically or in the reviews that you've been doing? Um, well, I mean, the. The city has uh, has obviously just sort of its general sign regulations, and we've got historic preservation uh, sign regs. Um, uh, there have been some 
uh, maybe some exceptions given for some of these buildings because of their particular characteristics. And I'm thinking particularly about studio theater, which uh, again, its expression uh, as, a, as a theater, um, I think they had to get some zoning relief for the size of their sign because it was so much larger than was permitted uh, under the sign code. Um, but uh, I, you know, obviously got support. Um, uh, so not not particularly. I mean, again, these are these are big buildings, and so some like so. I'm looking at the sign right now on the room and board. Um, that's a much bigger sign than would work on a little Victorian three story uh, commercial building. Um, so to a certain extent, uh, you know, the signage gets scaled to the size of the building, and on these bigger buildings, uh, maybe they it, it can take take larger signage. Uh, um, but again, I think that it's always been sort of a play between the character of the building, the location on the building, uh, um, and, uh, and, and and keeping in mind the arts district uh, that you know maybe some more creative uh, uh, commercial signs. Uh, are appropriate for uh, for a lively uh, neighborhood like this. Are there um, other major development sites still left on 14th Street to be developed? Um, there probably are. Um, uh, uh, one site uh, is currently occupied uh, by non-historic buildings. Uh, um, uh, it's the the frontiers uh, uh, housing uh, site, which also has a big uh, parking lot uh, just south of uh, S Street. Um, it's our understanding that there is uh, a long term effort to redevelop that. Uh, it doesn't involve any historic buildings or any auto showroom buildings. Um, uh, and then there are uh, smaller sites, uh, the southwest corner of um, uh, 14th and P, uh, the little one-story um, uh, Chinese restaurant, uh, 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 that is potentially a development site. Um, and, you know, I guess there's the potential for some of the smaller scale buildings to be collected together uh, with maybe some development potential back behind them. Uh, but uh, as far as the big sites go, um, they're, 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 pretty much, they're pretty much developed now. And one of the things that has been discussed um, a lot is because of the building boom that we had back in the 2000s when a lot of these buildings were developed is towards the end, right before COVID, a lot of retailers were having their leases, their 10-year leases were coming up. And of course, the, the cost of um, retail space on 14th. Do you, do you find that the cost of retail space on 14th Street is higher than in other areas or... Is that something that I? That's not something that I track. Uh, I, you know, uh, I'm not in the leasing business, so uh, <laughs> so I don't I, want to be. <laughs> I, I, no, I certainly don't want to be. Um, uh, I'm sure that there are uh, plenty of people that could answer that, but I'm just I'm, that's not my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one comment. Um, well. Uh, long-term member who used to get their sports car tuned up at Longview, where Longview Gallery is, 1234 Ninth Street, Northwest. There are lots of mechanics around in that area at that point. Um, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Zach, do we have any other questions on Facebook? No, nothing else from Facebook. Okay, great, great. Um, well, thank you for joining us. Is there anything you'd like to sum up with, Kim or Steve? Uh, no, thanks for giving us this opportunity to talk about automobile showrooms. Always fun to go down a little bit of memory lane here. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, when you introduced me, I've been doing preservation for 30 years in DC and surveying 14th Street was actually uh, my first architectural and historic resources survey. So I, I, it's one of my favorite streets as well. Yeah, and, and ditto that. Uh, it was actually my first survey as well. Uh, and I actually have a photograph of me surveying in front of the house that I ended up buying uh, like three years later. Uh, so um, 
Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been immensely rewarding seeing 14th Street go from what it had been uh, and just seeing all these buildings uh, revitalized and the whole street uh, revitalized. As I say, I, I think it's one of the most successful blends of urbanism and preservation and arts uh, uh, and entertainment in, uh, in the city. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm very pleased with the way it's turned out and it'll be interesting to see how it continues to evolve because it will, uh, things, things will change. Definitely. So thank you both for being a part of our adaptive reuse month. Of course, you know, a building that's occupied is better than a non-occupied building. So adaptive reuse is so important to what we do here with preservation in Washington. So I appreciate your role in it. And thank you so much for joining us today. Hope everybody has a great day. Thanks. Thank you.